this is Dr. Michael Lake, and I want to welcome you to another edition of the Kingdom War Room. Today we have my good friend Dr. Doug Hamp on here, and I want to kind of set the stage for his book. Imagine living in a world that artificial intelligence achieves godhood status on planet Earth. That superhumans begin manifesting themselves seemingly right out of, out of the Marvel comics on the landscape of human history. Alien entities claiming to be our creators are now ready to intervene in the history of humanity and become humanity's saviors. Guys, all this sounds like something out of a either a B sci-fi movie or something that maybe DC or DC Comics would uh, produce to entertain us uh, of Hollywood. But the truth is, these things are taken right out of the Word of God. That enfolded within the Word of God are the headlines that we're reading today and the possibilities that are unfolding before us. And today we have my good friend, Dr. Doug Hamp. He is the senior pastor of the Way Congregation in Denver, Colorado. He has authored numerous books, including his latest, Corrupting the Image, Part 3, The Singularity, Superhumans, and the Second Coming of Jesus. Doug, it's wonderful to have you on the show with us today. Thank you for having me. It's really great to be here. In your new book, it, you know, one of the things that I have enjoyed uh, about all three of your books uh, is your ability to not only dig deep within the original language to bring maybe connections that someone that uh, is not that familiar with the languages that, you know, I'm kind of a, a product of, of Bible prophecy. But it, when, I, when you look back in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, it's laughable. A lot mm -hmm. of the things that they, you know, the, the barcode on the back here, Campbell's Soup Can was the mark. <laughs> we get all these things. Right. When we're looking at it with the technology today and we begin understanding with 21st century eyes, all of a sudden the word of God begins to explode with a reality that we have never seen before, especially in, in, in Bible prophecy. And a lot of the things that you deal with, especially in this last book, you could literally pull from the pages of, of what we're seeing uh, if you're paying attention to the news. Uh, in fact, right. I was kind of looking through your table of contents, and one of the one of the chapters is called "A Plague That Comes from Mars." And it, it, brother, it's just been a month or so that NASA is worried they're getting ready to bring samples back from Mars, and they're worried about bringing a plague back <laughs> from Mars, and and right. how to contaminate the thing when when they when they bring it back. And all this was right in Bible prophecy, and it was long in your book before NASA ever made that announcement. And it's just amazing how that God will tell us things before they happen if we get into the Word. Indeed. Yeah, it's it's really exciting stuff uh, when you start putting it all together. And I agree with you. I think we're at a, a place where things are beginning to make sense, you know. And I, I try not to laugh at some of the things that were said before because people were doing their very best to, you know, put two and two together. But now we have just such a much better picture. And, you know, and when you start having a lot of secular people that are talking about transforming us and becoming humanity 2.0. Well, then I think we really should start taking notice of that, right? That it, it's not, you know, it's like you said, it's not the barcode. Uh, I remember that back in the 90s and I thought that was the thing, right? It was so amazing. Then you had the RFID chip and that seemed to be the mark of the beast. But, you know, each of these things, if they can be put in you, they can be taken out as well. But the Bible talks about something that's gonna be so fundamentally changing to the person that there's no going back right and i really wanted to understand what that was all about and my journey began in corrupting image number one where i was looking at genesis 315 i will cause enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed right and so i spent a lot of time looking at the genetics uh, of how this could potentially happen and i was trying to understand what was the genetics of the incarnation of jesus incarnation and then understand how the enemy is going to have a counterfeit of that. And I thought I had pretty much said everything I needed to say in that, in that book, but it turns out there's a whole lot more to that story. In Corrupting Image 2, I was really looking at the, the beast who was, is not, and will ascend out of, the, out of the other abyss. And I was looking at really the beast who was. That was the, the part that I was looking at. And I believe that it was Nimrod. Yeah. Uh, Nimrod's name means let's rebel. And I found that he was known as Ninurta in the ancient world. And there's tons of uh, documents, texts that talk about Ninurta and how he was the son of Enlil. And I discovered that Enlil is actually Satan, right? So 
that was incredibly foundational. I found a um, a cylinder seal of a woman riding the beast. I mean, it was just crazy stuff, right? So all of that was foundational. And then once we understand who the players are, I mean, we, of course, we knew it was the beast. We knew it was Satan. But understanding what were their ancient epithets and how those are going to then manifest in the present day, you know, what we're coming up with in the future is that the gods of old are going to be the aliens of the future. And, and I think we're somewhere toward, you know, kind of that that latter stage there of, of seeing this. And for the last 70, 80 years, we've been having UFOs showing up over the White House, right? They've been showing up over Washington, D.C. There was a, you know, there were huge uh declarations by the u.s government saying that yeah we don't know what these ufos are right and then in the 60s and 70s everything clamped down and you suddenly became a crackpot if you even talked about this stuff and then uh as late as 2017 uh is when the uh it's called the atip uh i forget that what that stands for but that's a, a government agency that said you know what actually yes uh all that stuff we've been talking about it's true and we don't know what these things are right and and so that's where we are today and I think that is the backdrop for the strong delusion. That is what is going to cause humanity ultimately to believe the lie instead of receiving the truth. And, you know, the, the lie ties right into Genesis, uh, you know, where the, where the Nephilim show up and all these different things of achieving godhood. In fact, what's interesting, and I, I looked at it in the tie-in to the last days, there was an article and it was about the uh, fall of Rome and how all the ancient em uh, emperors at the fall of Rome all thought they were becoming gods, becoming like Nimrod. And I'm thinking, well, the, the history tends to repeat itself that when the humanity thinks that it's, it's achieving this godhood kind of thing because of the ancient gods showing up, showing the next level, that, uh, that it's actually the decline that we see. There's this, there's this secular process that goes on. And I think we're we're on the final one before the Lord comes back. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, and I think something that uh, I, I discovered in my research that really kind of put me on a little bit of a different trajectory, trajectory than a lot of people is that the the role of the two witnesses. So so here's the basic scenario. You have, you know, God decides when the seals are going to open. And I think when he opens those seals, that's when the two witnesses come. Their message, right, they come clothed in sackcloth. That means that they're coming to tell the world to repent, right? Sackcloth is always about repentance. Mm -hmm. And we know that God always sends a witness before a major judgment. He had Noah before the flood. He had Lot before Sodom and Gomorrah. He had Jonah unwillingly before uh, he was going to destroy Nineveh. And of course, Nineveh repented, right? So when you have the end of it all, of course, God is going to send a witness. In this case, he's gonna send two witnesses. Now, I happen to think that those two witnesses are going to be Moses and Elijah. I know there's some debate on that, but uh, even if it's not those two specific people, I think there will be two people who come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah. And it's interesting that on Mount Hermon, where Jesus was transfigured, you actually had Moses and Elijah showing up. And I think they're going to be the ones that will come in the last days with a message of repentance, right? Moses was essentially telling Pharaoh, hey, you need to let my people go and you need to essentially repent, right? Because my God is stronger than you and you think you're a God, right? And how did that turn out for him? Not so well, right? It turned out really badly. Then of course you had Elijah who confronted Ahab and Jezebel. And again, the, the message was repent and that didn't turn out so well. So I think we're gonna see an absolute repeat of that. And they're going to bring those particular plagues upon the earth. Let's think about it. They're going to bring um, a time of no rain upon the earth, right? We are, we're already suffering from a massive drought, and it seems to be worldwide. Uh, I, I don't think that this is it, but I think this is just a precursor, a preview of what's going to come. And when it does come by the hand of the two witnesses, it's going to be terribly worse, okay? And that will then cause course forest fires that will cause uh, you know obviously drought starvation uh, disruption of the food chain there will be uh, the waters turning to blood at least a third of them that's going to disrupt the food chain we know it will be a lot of the fish will die and that's going to of course affect us 
that'll affect economies. Uh, you'll have um, the earth being struck with plagues as often as they desire. That's pretty radical, right? And if we've seen what some of those plagues were in the days of Moses, for example, then we probably could ex you know, ex uh, expect to see something of a similar nature. And here's the thing, the world is going to rally together to try to stop the two witnesses. And it says, if anyone tries to stop them, that fire will come out of their mouths and consume them. Well, where do we have an example of that? We have that with Elijah, when um, the uh, the king of, of, of Israel tried to said, you know, come over here and talk to me. And he, he just said, well, if I'm a prophet of God, let fire descend from heaven. And right, it just consumed those 50 soldiers. So that's going to be something very similar. Now, maybe it comes from heaven. Maybe it comes out of their mouth. I'm not sure. Uh, I tend to think it's going to come out of the sky, but we'll have to wait and see. And when all of the militaries of the world are trying to stop these two guys because they're causing all of this havoc, they will not be able to stop them. And this is when I think the world is going to become very despondent. And they're like, oh, no, what do we do? We have no way with our weapons to stop them. And I think this is when the light bulb is going to go on for a lot of people. And they say, wait a second, there are other um, beings that are on this world that are also powerful. And we've already had incursions with them. We know that their weaponry is far above ours. We know that no matter what we try, they, they outmatch us. They're at least a thousand years ahead of us, technologically speaking, right? And, and again, this is on record now. We've had the um, US Navy has, uh, there, there are videos that have been released from the US Navy where they're following this Tic Tac-like object and they're astounded how fast it can move. They can barely keep up with it. And then it kind of toys with them for a little bit and then it just disappears. Uh, and sometimes they've seen it go from 80,000 feet down to sea level in a matter of seconds, right? And there's nothing on earth that could possibly do that or any person that could possibly withstand the G-forces. And sometimes it goes from high up in the sky and it goes right into the ocean. And everyone who's watching this footage, they're like a splash, you know, but there's no splash. It does not splash. This is some kind of a trans-dimensional or extra-dimensional being or craft that is able to intersect our world without affecting our laws of physics in the ways that we understand. And so uh, a lot of research, researchers have begun to understand that, that these are not, um, they're not beings who live in this plane of existence, but live in a different plane of existence. Uh, uh, it was um, George Knapp, who is a, a UFO researcher, he suggested that they exist behind a thin psychical dimensional membrane. And when I heard him say that, I was like, oh my goodness, that's crazy because that's what the Bible talks about. It's called the veil, right? Mm -hmm. There's a veil between heaven and earth. And we've seen it opened on a number of occasions. Ezekiel uh, sitting by the river Hebar with the captives of Judah, he saw the heavens open. Uh, Jesus at his baptism, the heavens were opened. Stephen, when he's being stoned, the heavens were opened. Uh, John, when he's seeing in Revelation, and he says he, he saw that the heavens were opened, right? So all these times, there's this, this veil between heaven and earth. And the Bible actually calls it the veil, that the veil that is over all mankind is going to disappear. It's going to come down. And it's even described as a scroll being rolled up, right? That's what it's going to essentially look like. And I think we've seen this in the movies time and again. Um, you know, I just went and saw Doctor Strange, right? Every time they open up some kind of a portal between worlds. I think that's the basic idea that we're talking about, that, you know, if we could just kind of rip a, rip open the, the sky or the atmosphere and you could then go through to a different dimension, that's essentially what we're talking about. So when they start talking about these beings have always lived here, right? And then uh, others have said that, well, I think that they live in the oceans. And again, a light bulb went on. I'm like, wait a second, the Bible talks about you know, John says that he was standing on the seashore and he saw the beast rising up out of the sea. I'm like, <laughs> right there it is, right? It's just on the money, so much on the money. It's talking about the same things that the Bible is talking about. But what we have to do is we have to kind of translate the language a little bit because we don't find alien UFO tech, uh, techno technological language in the Bible. But we hear about something called spiritual beings, angels, fallen angels, whatever you want to call them. Uh, we know that they exist in some other dimension. And that's what the Bible's talking about. So, so again, 
the, the scenario here is that the two witnesses are causing havoc for three and a half years on planet Earth. Um, the uh, governments of the Earth have no way to stop these two. So what you need to do is to find a um, another being that can fight fire with fire, right? And so this is where I think Satan is going to, and of course he's not Satan, he's not gonna look like Satan, he's gonna be some ascended master who's an uh, you know ancient and wise being who has evolved over millions of years, like that's the basic scenario, right? But he's gonna come and say, listen, we've been here, we've been watching over planet Earth, just making sure that everything's going okay. And we knew this day would come when uh, our adversaries would finally show up on planet Earth and we're ready, right? And so this is where he's gonna suggest, look, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a person of my choosing and I'm gonna combine myself with him and he'll become an avatar. And I'm gonna mingle my DNA with his DNA so that he and I become one. And the Bible talks about this, right? Again, the beast that was, is not, and ascends out of the abyss. And the reason I spent a lot of time looking at the ancient world in Corrupting Image Volume 2 is because I wanted to understand what happened with Nimrod and other things and, and Satan's basic agenda, right? It was incredibly exciting in my opinion, right? But uh, so it says that the beast that was, is not, and will ascend out of the abyss, right? So what has already been is what's going to happen. And then we're told that the dragon is going to give his power, throne, and authority to the beast, right? So they're going to have the same agenda, the same power, same throne, uh, the same authority. And I would suggest that they're essentially one. Yeah. Uh, if you've seen the movie Avatar, then that's the basic idea. You've got this empty shell of a body that is waiting for a spirit to possess it. But in this case, you'll have uh, a, a person who has his own spirit, but he's going to succumb and welcome and want Satan to completely take over. I would call it possession plus, okay? That it's going to be more than possession. And here's where it gets really freaky, right? Is there uh, was a guy, uh, is a guy named, um, <clears throat> gosh, I just forgot his name, <laughs> but he's out of uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, I think it's John. Anyway, his name, so it doesn't matter. So he had leukemia and he needed a bone marrow transplant. So there was a, a nice person, a donor from Germany who gave some bone marrow. And he then of course got this bone marrow transplant and there was a forensics lab that was kind of monitoring all this. They just wanted to see what would happen. And after so many months, they discovered that the DNA in his blood had changed to that of his donor. And then after uh, a bit longer, they discovered that it actually uh, it was actually Chris. His name was Chris out of Reno, Nevada. But they said that Chris, uh, Chris's, um, the DNA of his semen had changed to that of his donor, right? And so they're all just like, this is crazy. This guy, Chris, has become a chimera, and Chris is disappearing, and his donor is taking the place. And that's what I suggest is going to happen between the beast and Satan. That that Satan is going to give of his seed. Remember, we we talked about that in. Genesis chapter three, right? Between your seed and her seed. So your seed, Satan's seed, he's gonna give that to the person of his choosing. And this person will become a chimera. He will become a God, uh, a, a hybrid being, right? And so then once that happens, then he will have the wherewithal to go and to fight against the two witnesses. And the Bible tells us that he's going to overcome them. He's gonna kill them, right? So the world is gonna be ecstatic at this point. And I also think that he's gonna go, at some point he's gonna go into, whether it's a, a built temple or a, a just a tabernacle structure or a tent or whatever it may be, but some holy of holies place in Jerusalem, presumably on the Temple Mount. And he's gonna go in there and he's gonna declare himself to be God. But it, it, Paul says that not only does he declare himself to be God, but he's going to show himself to be God. Right, so it's not just empty words. He's going to have the um, he's going to have the goods, right? To to really say, look, not only am I God, but I'm going to show you that I'm a God. And whether this happens before or after he kills the two witnesses, I think Scripture is not entirely clear on that point. But you know, he's going to do this. The world is going to be so happy when he kills the two witnesses, right? Revelation 11 tells us that he 
that the world is going to start sending gifts to one another and there's going to be this rejoicing and their dead bodies of course are going to be left for three and a half days in the streets of jerusalem uh, so that everybody can see what's going on but after three and a half days the breath of life uh, enters into them and they hear a voice from heaven or this voice from heaven says you know aluhena come up here uh you know it probably says that in hebrew i suspect and uh and up they go right and so at this point the world is freaking out like wait a second this is really scary right the beast was over to able to overcome them which is cool but then they rose from the dead and what have they been telling us for three and a half years repent our boss is coming back and so this is where i think the world is going to get on board completely and say you know what we have to rally together we've got to come together and um we all have to get the upgrade because there's an army coming and we need to be ready to fight against this army right and so i think that will take us into the mark of the beast you know as i was reading through uh your third book uh, i've been you know, of course you know I've, I've been a student and trying to research everything the illuminati is doing and, and different things and uh, one of the things that i have heard uh I will call them verifiable rumors, is they have literally tried to house a principality. Mm. The human body cannot sustain it. It will destroy the human body. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reading through your book and I'm thinking, this is, you know, I always looked at, you know, corrupting humanity so that they're no longer human. There's some type of Raphaim. They're no longer redeemable. But I, it had never dawned on me that for the, the son of perdition, that there would have to be an upgraded body available to be able to house that much power. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then so it, it, it kind of brings the whole uh, transhumanist movement in, into into real focus, not only for the mark of the beast, but even the upgrade that the beast himself is going to need to be able to, to have this uh, type of incarnation that we're going to see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's interesting, it says that you know, they're going to combine, but they're not going to stay together, right? Daniel chapter two talks about that, uh, you know, they're going to essentially put themselves on humanity, but it's not going to work out, right? So, yeah, it, it's, uh, there's so much that, that's in there. Um, I think this also would explain how in Revelation chapter nine, it says that, that men um, were seeking death, but it was fleeing from them. I mean, how crazy is that? I mean, it's it's a terrible reality that people commit suicide quite successfully every day, right? But there a time will come when men will try to commit suicide and they will not be able to, right? And, and I think that is a result of having taken the mark of the beast, right? Uh, having gotten this upgrade, they wanted to become gods. It made perfect sense. They have to do this for the 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 salvation of planet earth because there's an existential threat that's out there and and so you know when they combine their dna with uh with satan's dna it's not going to work out ultimately it probably will it'll probably be like a little uh, honeymoon phase for a little while but it's gonna that relationship is going to sour very, very very quickly so i think we'll see zombies as well God, you, you wanted you, know, you wanted immortality how do you like it now uh, exactly. In fact, a good friend of mine, Dr. Carl Koch, he's an expert in Hebrew like you are. I'd, he he makes me look like I'm still playing with with crayons when it comes to Hebrew. Uh, when he looked at when um, you know Adam had said and God came down and said, Adam, where are, you know where are you? He said basically he said in in the Hebrew what's truly expressed is how's it working out for you now? <laughs> how's that working out for you? <laughs> and I, I think that when we see that they want death, but can't they? Humanity strove together, did all these things, and they think they're achieving their pinnacle by achieving immortality. Mm -hmm. And now the reverse is now that they got it, they want to die. Right, right. Because and it's really sad because they can't go back, right? That's what yeah. is so tragic. Yeah. But, you know, there's there's a whole other layer to this thing, which is the covenant with death and shale. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and trying to understand how it works because it says in in revelation that all that authority was given to the beast over every tribe tongue and nation and language right so he has authority over everybody um and i was i kept thinking where does he get the authority from 
Well, if we if we go back a little bit to when Satan took Jesus to the mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, he said, look, all of this has been delivered to me and I can give it to whoever I want. And so, you know, just bow down and I'll give it to you. Thankfully, Jesus didn't do that. Right. But I don't think Satan was, um, you know, blowing smoke. I think that he was absolutely uh, legitimate on that. And Jesus did not seem to challenge that claim either. And Jesus even called him the God of this world. You know, we know he was the prince of the power of the air, all these different epithets that are, are, are ascribing kingship, lordship to Satan. Where did he get that? Who who ascribed it to him? Well, it wasn't God. It was actually Adam because God gave dominion of the planet to Adam and then Adam squandered it and maybe he got hoodwinked, whatever we want to think, but he lost it and it then fell into the hands of Satan. And Satan had that and he exploited that and he was rather boastful about this new thing that he had for roughly 4,000 years. And we see in things like the Akitu festival where the ancient king would would act a, a, on behalf of, uh, of Nimrod or Ninurta. And then they would reenact this thing called the Akitu festival where it was the reenactment of the slaying of the creator God who was his name was Anu and then the Anu ship that that rightful authority that was the creators then fell into the hands of Enlil and it became the Enlil ship and then Enlil could give that authority to whomever he wanted and he gave it to Nimrod or Ninurta so you know he he was boastful about this for all those years and it says in the book of Hebrews that um that Jesus took away the the power of death and the fear of death that was held over people's lives all those years he took it away from the devil right so that's in in hebrews 2 14 it talks about that so this is i i think this is what we have to understand is that satan has to get the authority again right jesus took it out of his hands at the cross and of course now jesus rightfully has the dominion but humanity has free will and we can still decide what we want to do and so i think even though we've been rescued he satan needs to get us back into a bind once again and that's where we come to the covenant with death and shell in isaiah 28 it talks about it says woe to you scornful men who rule this people who are in jerusalem for you say we've made a covenant with death and with shale we are in agreement so i think that yes the leadership of jerusalem is going to make that covenant but i would also suggest that the whole world is going to make that covenant and here's where it gets really cool this is uh something i was looking at if you were like me, you you probably heard a number of times that in the uh, the fourth seal, it's going to be uh, a death of a of a fourth of humanity. That's how I used to read it. I don't know where you are on that right now, but um, so what it was exciting is it says when he opened the fourth seal, uh, the fourth creature of pale horse, the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given him over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, the hunger and death, and by beasts of the earth. All right, so I used to think, well, that means a fourth of humanity is gonna die, but that's not what it says. All right, first of all, note their names, death and Hades. Hades in Hebrew is Sheol, all right? So you have death and Sheol, it's the same dynamic duo that we found in Isaiah chapter 28. All right, so that's, that's pretty significant. And then it also says that power was given to him. The word power in Greek is exousia, which is authority. I think power is really the, not the best word to translate there. Exousia is authority. Yeah. And then I was looking at a fourth of the earth. I'm like, wait, it's a fourth of the earth. It's, you know, um, Epitis Geese, which is over the planet, not humanity. So then I kind of got curious. I'm like, well, wait a second. I know that we have, that the oceans, you know, that the earth is covered with water, about 72% of, of the earth's surface. But then I started thinking, I wonder how much uh, of the of the Earth's surface area we actually live on. So I found this study by Tobler et al. from like 1999, and they divided the Earth into like 217 different uh, hexagons or something like that, or polygons or something. And 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 so they did this study and they discovered, yeah, drum roll please, that 25.4% of the Earth's surface is where we live. And I'm like, no way, that's incredible. <laughs> that's just amazing. Right, it's exactly on the money. 
as to what the Bible says, that he will have authority over one fourth of the planet. That means that everywhere that people dwell is where he has authority. And I was like, oh my goodness, that is just amazing, right? I mean, wow. You know, so you have you have that, you have in Revelation 13 talking about this authority that he has. How does he get the authority? Well, this was I would suggest that humanity, at least the governments of the earth, are going to give him that authority. And I, I take it back to Daniel chapter 9, where it talks about the uh, the Brit La Rabim, right? So the, the covenant of many. Um, I think that is where the governments of the world are going to say, we need to do anything, and they're desperate. Remember, they're desperate. When people are feeling desperate, they do desperate things, right? And And when you think you have an existential threat to planet Earth, as presented by these two witnesses. And again, they're not two witnesses. These are these are uh, advanced uh, alien beings who have invaded our world and they're making demands of us that we don't like. Uh, we don't like this, this creator that they keep talking about. If you happen to see the movie Prometheus, uh, in the movie, these strange looking aliens show up millions of years ago and one of them takes this strange potion and he begins to disintegrate and he falls into the, the river and then his DNA, you know, then, you know, cut to the next scene. <laughs> his DNA is what made all life on planet Earth. OK, whatever. <clears throat> and then sometime in the future, uh, humanity, uh, a really rich guy makes this cool spaceship and they fly out to the creator's uh, planet. And it turns out when we get there, we don't like our creators. They're just a bunch of jerks and they're trying to eat us for lunch, right? So we don't like them. I think that's the same general scenario that we're gonna have expressed here is like, okay, maybe the God of the Bible did create us. Okay, but you know what? He's just an advanced being. He's evolved, we can evolve and we don't like him. Maybe he started us, but you know, we don't like dad. He's just a real jerk. And we don't want to submit to him. We don't wanna go along with his plan. He obviously has these archaic, strange, um, unfair, I'm trying to think of nice words, uh, values that we do not hold to, right? He's he's incredibly old fashioned and stuffy so and whatever. We're trying to become Nietzscheans and <laughs> to where we can, we're, we're beyond right and wrong and we will do whatever we want. Exactly, yeah. right, you know, and of course, you know, the God of the Bible as uh, Richard Dawkins stated it, you know, he's genocidal, he's homophobic. You know, now, of course, he's he's against transgender. He's against all of these things that humanity seems to care about. And, and those are just the, 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 the tip of the iceberg, right? There's so many different things. And, and humanity is going to say, what? We don't want this. And remember that all during this time, we also have the woman that rides the beast, right? So the world is given over to the pleasures and the lusts of the woman. And, and I don't I don't mean just females. I mean, you know, this this goddess Inanna and all that she entails, right? That is essentially what the world is, uh, what what are the values of the world? And so to think that we can't have her, we, we, we like her values. And you're telling us we have to get rid of that stuff? No way, Jose, right? And so this is where the world is going to be desperate and they'll say, we'll do anything. So this is where Satan says, okay, I know you have a problem with those two witnesses. I'll get rid of them for you. No problem but it'll just cost you a little bit, right? I just need you to sign my little covenant with death and shell, right? And, you know, whether it's a paper contract or just a verbal agreement, whatever it is, or just a, a nod and a wink, you know, um, the world's gonna say, we'll do whatever, you know, whatever your price, we will do it because we need to get rid of these guys. And you know, to, when, to make, sorry, go ahead. When, when you look at this and you think, well, how ridiculous would this be for the world leaders to do this? The United Nations is already priming the pump for all this and has been for years that they're talking about the New World Order. They're talking about its connection with the Luciferian, Luciferian initiative. I mean, in, in fact, uh, the, the guy that headed up one section, he, he said, listen, he said to be a part of the New World Order, you must take the Luciferian initiative. And they have since kind of silenced him because he kind of revealed the beans long before it was supposed to be revealed. But everything about the United Nations coming together was to unite them so that they could rally around and call for the son of perdition when it's time for him. So that this foundation of what you're laying in this book, they're, they're going to need to have a Hegelian event to precipitate it, mm -hmm. the two witnesses, 
but they have been laying the foundations for it for over almost 100 years. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and I would suggest that, you know, Satan may not know when the curtain's going to go up, but he can sure set the stage, right? Yeah. So that when it does go up, he doesn't know when, but he's got the stage ready to go. The actors are in place, the props are where they need to be, everything is there. And that's what I think the the whole uh, UFO phenomenon or alien deception is uh, has been doing, is setting that big stage to say, look, uh, we've just been, you know, we've been here watching over you guys, kind of like a big brother, but trying to not get in your way. But if ever there's a crisis, you can call on us, right? You know that we're powerful. Um, and there have been times when UFOs have been spotted over nuclear silos, nuclear missile silos, and they've they've caused them to go from a ready-go state to a non-go state, right? And uh, you know, it's, it took them, you know, hours to get everything back online and ready to go, right? And and so people have been interpreting that. Well, maybe it's what they're trying to say is, hey, we don't like nuclear weapons. We live here too. We're concerned that you're going to destroy the whole planet, right? So people have been looking at this in different ways. Uh, there's other people that have been looking at these, these these UFOs and aliens or whatever and saying, well, they're really here to help us. And if we could get a hold of their technology, you know, that would only benefit us. And I, I couldn't help but think back to the Twilight Zone. There was a, a episode called uh, To Serve Man. And these aliens come, <laughs> they come and uh, they've got this book and it says To Serve Man, right? And 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 it was the linguists who were able to translate just the the title of the book. And so everybody thought, oh, they're here to help us. They're here to, you know, do the, all these great things for us. And the aliens made lots of promises. And then they got, they convinced some people to get on their spaceship and to go back with them to the home planet. So as they're, everyone's getting on the, on the ship, this one woman comes and says, uh, Mr. Chambers, Mr. Chambers, don't get on the ship. We translated the rest of the book. It's a cookbook. <laughs> I remember and, that episode. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and I, I think that's what we're looking at is that, you know, they're coming pretending that they're here to help us, but they're not here to help us. They're here to eat us for lunch. That's the basic agenda. But, you know, we're falling into this deception uh, because we want to. And that's what's interesting is in um, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is talking about that very thing. He says that the coming of the, of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. So I would suggest that in the context of the end times, the, the truth, the love of the truth that they were supposed to accept had been clearly presented to them by the two witnesses. But the world at large said, nope, we're not interested in that. We don't like that. And so because they did not receive the love of the truth presented by the two witnesses, then they're going to receive this strong delusion, which says, you know, alien and uh, Satan and his guys posing as good aliens are saying that we're here to save you. You can trust us and we'll take care of those guys. And that's what we see in scripture is that the beast, comes up out of the abyss, he's able to destroy or kill the two witnesses, but then everybody, but then they rise from the dead and everyone's freaking out, right? And, and so this is where the mark of the beast takes on a whole new perspective, right? You know, again, we probably, for many years, we heard that the mark of the beast is going to be so we can check out faster at Walmart or something like that. When it was the whole barcode theory, you're like, oh no, you know, but you know, that, that, that seems rather um, sophomoric at the moment, right? Because it's far more sinister than that. And, and I think because there's going to be fear behind it, incredible fear, the sense that, listen, we all need to come together. Uh, the very existence of planet Earth is dependent on us working together. We need to get rid of all those old squabbles. And we all have to upgrade. You know why? Because there is an advanced race of beings that are coming to fight against us. And so we need to come together. And so everybody needs to take this upgrade so you can become a God and we can fight these. And t I'm telling you, we can overcome this greatest of, of enemies that we've ever experienced. We can overcome them if we come together. But here's the thing. 
everybody needs to take it. There can be no exceptions. And if you don't want to take it, well, maybe you're siding with the other guys. And I think there's going to be kind of a, you know, there's the, the happy stage. Everybody needs to take this. Here's the reasons to take it. That's the incentivization. That's the, that's the carrot, right? The incentive. But then when people are not willing, then you get out the stick. And the first stick is, look, if you're not willing to take this, then I don't know if you can be part of our society. You know, maybe you can't buy or sell if you don't have this. And here's what's even ama amazing is that uh, China, among other countries, has developed an entire social credit system where they have 300 million cameras in their country. That's still fewer than what Britain has, <laughs> incidentally. All right. And but what China has is all these cameras are monitoring you and they're seeing what you do. If you if you jaywalk when you're not supposed to, which you're never supposed to, then your your social credit score will go down. But if you go visit your sick mother, it'll go up, right? If you pay your taxes on time, your your score will go up. If you say something against the government, it'll go down. Um, you know, and so they're watching you all the time. So just imagine they put a few more lines of code in there and they can look for some kind of a mark here or a mark here. And they're like, okay, we see it. Good. This is definitely somebody who's on the right team. But if they don't see it, uh-oh, this person is not good. And what China has done is that if your credit score goes too low, they can restrict you from buying airplane tickets, going to the movies, getting on high speed rail, right? They can make your life difficult because you're not acting like a good citizen. And most Chinese are for this system. They think it's a good idea, right? So you could easily see how something like that could be quickly converted uh, to a worldwide system. And you're just looking for that mark. And the mark says, you're with us. You're, you're standing with humanity to get rid of or to fight against this uh, this how uh, <clears throat> excuse me this hostile uh, force that's coming but if you're not well this is a problem and then you get out a bigger stick because if you know buying and selling is one thing and if people are still not compliant well you know what uh, clearly you're a traitor you are not for humanity you are for the aliens and if you're for the aliens then you're my enemy and I can't trust you and we need to take you expunge you from planet earth <laughs> okay and uh, and so that is where we start going into um, to executions. And just a, just a this is just a, a little pet theory I have, but I think that people uh, Christians are going to be encouraged, um, and their faith will be strengthened like never before when they see the two witnesses. And I think people will say, you know what, you know I've been believing in Jesus, all this stuff, but my faith like to actually do things has been so weak, but now I see how you do it. And now I have faith to move mountains. I have faith to heal the sick and raise the dead. So it could be that the initial way that they kill people is not beheading. It's just, I don't know, maybe they do it rather humanely or something. And then when the bodies are given to the Christians, they lay hands on them and they bring them back to life. I think that's entirely possible. I, scripture doesn't say that, but I think it's a plausible scenario. And so then to make sure they stay dead off of the head, right? Try to resurrect a corpse with no head. That's pretty difficult. Okay. So again, just a pet theory, but we'll see. You know, when, when you look at all of this and then I've kind of wondered when I look at the scenario, you know, is it a mark? You know, you know sometimes when you look at, um, when I look at, you know, forehead, right hand, right hand is, is your strength, the strength of your arm. So it's changing way, what you think and what you do. But I think it's it's going to, when you look at that type of augmentation, I mean, you can you can look at somebody and tell if they've been taking steroids, if they've been a weightlifter, if they have if they have taken way too many steroids and they've abused that there are telltale signs. And so I think there's going to be physiological changes that are going to be easy to detect mm. uh, if you have been enhanced or not. Right, yes, I agree. I, I totally agree. Yeah, um, I think it makes perfect sense. You know, but it's just kind of putting this whole thing in a in like a futuristic sci-fi lens. I think it, it it really brings out a lot, and I think the movies have been preparing us for this. I think, well, <laughs> it's going to be scary. Let's put it that way. <laughs> in America, you know, go ahead and take the the super the super soldier serum and and become yeah. America. I mean, yeah. all this stuff has been programming us 
And, you know, I, I enjoy the, the action hero movies as much as anybody else. Sure. At the same time, I see them revealing their own game plan and the programming that's going into it. Yep. And, uh, and I, I think that as, as Christians, we need to address this stuff, not to glamorize what they're doing. And I, I see some of them trying to, you know, last thing you need is a pastor running around a Superman suit. OK, <laughs> uh, sure. but but to take this and say, listen, they're drawing this from something. Mm-hmm. And and it's been it's leading humanity down down a certain path, and and to be able to do that, and all of a sudden, I, I think that one of the things that we have, uh, part of the church has failed, is we have we have tried to identify with culture by becoming like the culture instead of contrasting, being contrasted to the culture with a kingdom culture. Mm-hmm. But if we if we look at these things and begin teaching Bible prophecy, which you know, luckily you and I do, and there, there are a handful of them that do that. Most of the evangelical church today has abandoned uh, teaching of Bible prophecy when there, there's more stuff to preach on now than there ever has been that will connect the dots and help the Word of God come alive to those that, that, that we're, we're trying to reach. And instead, we're missing the mark by trying to uh, uh, become culturally relevant in, in ways that, that aren't really biblical. And so I, when, when I look at your books, one of the things that I so enjoy is that is that you're able to put it in a framework that this next generation is going to understand. Hmm. Because well, you know, what you call a, a sci-fi lens is, it, it, we're, not, we're not talking 50 years in the future, we're talking about maybe next week. I mean, we're talking, <laughs> Right. Because when, when you realize uh, this, is one of the things that I have found out when you deal with black science, they're 100 to 150 years ahead of mm. the best technology that we're aware of. Right. Yeah. And uh, many of these, many of the components that 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 uh, that the center perdition is going to need are already there. It's just waiting to be revealed. Lucifer has really set the stage technologically with the with the with the first nations of the earth. And he's just waiting for the for the time to trigger it all, and that that's why we need to prepare the people. And I want to encourage everyone to get all three of Doug's books because each one builds on the other. And and by the time you get to the third book, you're going to start seeing the evening news different. You're going to start seeing scientific articles different. You're going to start seeing how these things are beginning to fall into place. Uh, even with uh, with the the pandemic that we had, I, I see. Um, exper- social experiments going on to see just how difficult it is to make everybody take something or how easy it would be and how to adjust their tactics and different things. Mm-hmm. All of this, I think, was preparatory for something bigger to come. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's entirely plausible. And But when, when you have a threat that's visible, that's real, the two witnesses, they're doing things it becomes very hard to to uh, you know ignore that uh you know, i think with you know covid and stuff you could kind of look at it one way or the other and uh you know we, we know the, what happened of course so we don't need to rehash that but i think when you have the two witnesses and they're doing these plagues they're turning the earth, the waters to blood they're striking the earth with plagues then it becomes very real and you know that i think is a huge part of what we need to to be looking at and um, of course, I spent a lot of time talking about that in the book, but then, and so many other things, right? And we're, and I, I, so unfortunately, I'm out of time, but we, um, you know, basically, we're going to get to the the climax of this thing, where it looks like Satan and the beast have won, right? They've got the whole world in their hands. Nobody can stand against them. There's just that little enclave in Jerusalem that maybe, just maybe, is going to say the right words to bring back Yeshua. And that will be mankind's last hope. And well, you know, the way we know the way that the story ends is that they're going to do it, and Jesus will come back. And then we've got a whole epic battle in the Battle of Armageddon. That's a that's a whole other chapter, right? That's a whole other show. But um, you know, it's pretty exciting to see how it all turns out. So it's neat, pretty cool stuff. I want to thank you for being on with us today. Uh, all your books are on Amazon. And yes. your ministry, uh, your website is uh, douglashamp.com. Uh, you also now have it on audiobook. 
Yes. For those yes. that uh, you can be jogging and exercising and and get the download that way. And so, guys, I encourage you to do it. This is vital information for the hour in which we're living. And Doug, thank you for being on with us today. Thank you for having me. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.